Peter, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about, about myself and what we do, um, and then I'm going to tell you what my favorite pro-life argument is, and then we'll do some Q&A. Um, I've been in the pro-life movement full-time since I was 18 years old. Um, it was I chose this over a professional music career. I had a contract from National sent to me to be a full-time keyboard guy, uh, and I ended up not doing that because there are a lot of really great musicians and not enough great young pro-life speaker guys. So I had to make a choice. Um, and so uh, I've spent most of my time trying to help pro-life people have better conversations. And two and a half years ago, my brother and I started Equal Rights Institute because there were enough things that we wanted to be able to talk about um, and do in apologetics that just weren't being done anywhere else. Um, and so there was some, some things that we wanted to bring to the pro-life movement um, that we felt like we could do really well. Um, I, this is the way, the way I usually describe what I do is I, I was actually in a Denver airport um, a couple years ago and I sat across from this woman, this, this woman in her late 30s, like a businesswoman, I had like enough time to just like eat my sandwich and get on my plane. And she asked me, what do I do for a living? Which is an awful, awful question to ask someone who's just full-time pro-life work. It's like, what are you going to say? This is a weird job. Um, and so I told her I try to help pro-lifers to be not so weird. Like, that's what I care about. Um, how can we connect better with the people that we talk to? Um, how can we make more good arguments and fewer bad ones? And more importantly, how can we be loving to people? Um, like, I, I'm not going to get really religious today, but um, I would like to see people be more like the way I think Jesus would be if you talked to a pro-choice person. So what does that look like? What would it look like if Jesus talked to a pro-choice person? his body language be like? What kinds of questions would he ask? What kind of questions would he not ask? What would it sound like when he made arguments that were grounded in truth, like not holding back from truth, but like spoken with grace and gentleness? What, what does that mark? I want to help pro-lifers get more close to that mark. Um, because I don't know if you pay attention to the news or social media, but civil discourse is like at an all-time low right now. Every, like, people just go after each other, and it's nasty, and it's divisive, and it's awful. And you don't see a lot of change happen that way. People are not changing each other's minds because they're screaming at each other on Facebook or YouTube comments. And so I want to see a pro-life movement become more effective at actually changing people's minds. And I think part of that means um, being a lot more relational. So we talk a lot about that. Um, I told the group at the, at the Students for, for Life Leadership Summit a, a few days ago that um, we had test. We, we like to test arguments. One of the things we like to do is we like to go into like a college campus and when we do outreach, we like to try new things. One of the things we wanted to do when Tim and I started Deco Rice Institute was we wanted to credit, create an innovative and flexible pro-life apologetics organization. We're not just going to like have a set of arguments and then use the same arguments uh, for the next 20 or 30 years because what changes minds changes. Um, Pro-choice college students today think differently than they did five or ten years ago. The way we like process things psychologically changes. Um, and if that's true, then sometimes like we might have like a true arguments, ones that are like, like the, the, the syllogism is valid, but aren't actually connecting with people, aren't persuading people. And so I'm super interested in finding out what are the kinds of arguments that actually change minds. I want to see people actually change their minds and not have them. Um, and so when we go to, onto a college campus, that's our lab. We like to do R&D. One of the last outreaches we did was at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. And Tim and I walked onto that campus, and we knew. We'd already figured out the three things we were going to test that day. And one of them turned out to be really interesting. Had really interesting. I don't have time to talk about that today. But... Uh, is to get my course uh, we get into it. Um, so anyway, that, that's something that we like to do. And sometimes we try things that we like, this is going to be amazing. And it fails miserably. It's like this is complete wipeout. And then we try other things, and it works a lot better than anything we've tried before. And so we just do a lot of testing, and we can then you know, uh, send out what we're learning instantly to the students that we're working with. One of the times that we did that was several years ago. Actually, before we started Equal Rights Institute. Um, but Tim and I were already doing work together, and we were connecting with this other pro-life group called Justice for All. And they had heard this interesting person in argument from this guy named Dr. J.P. Moreland at Biola, brilliant philosophy professor. And he made this person argument that was different than the one that I spent most of my career teaching in pro-life apologetics. So all of us, like, 
a, you know, something like a dozen pro-life advocate people starting to so just trying. My brother and a guy, Steve Wagner, mm -hmm. I can't read, but it, like, it, really the original thing is, is really just a stupid argument. And so we started trying this thing. And I have never seen any single argument change more minds about abortion. Like, we, we use dozens and dozens of arguments. And most people won't change their mind in front of you. Most people change their mind months or years later. Like, that's just how people are. And that's how you are, too. Like, you're, you don't just change your mind just because you talk to, you know, uh, you know an atheist once. So you're like... Like, like they're, they're, it takes time to, to, to investigate our views. But we do see sometimes people change their minds right in front of us. And these days, like 75% of the time that I see it happen is because of this argument that we just started trying relatively recently. So I call it the most undervalued argument in the pro-life movement um, because I want everybody using it because it's so effective. And I think part of the reason why it's effective is it's not, it's not a religious argument. Um, in, in, in an age, uh, a growing age where like more young people are pro-life, but they're also more young people than ever before are secularists, um, or like we consider ourselves like atheists or agnostics. Starting with like Psalm 139 or Jeremiah 1:5 or you know John the Baptist kicking his mother's womb in the presence of first trimester Jesus is not necessarily going to be the most effective approach. Um, and so we're not starting with religion; we're starting with equality as our first premise. Something that our generation cares about more than maybe just about anything else. Um, so I, uh, my handwriting is too bad to use this thing, <laughs> this cool smart board. But I'm just going to kind of explain to you a little bit about how this argument goes, and then we'll take some questions. Um, the first question that kind of makes the skeleton of the equal rights argument is, do we have an equal right to life? And by we, we don't mean the unborn. We mean like human adults, the really like the, the, the most obvious case we can start with. Um, if so, doesn't that mean that there's something the same about us? Isn't there something that we all have in common? And this is key, don't miss this. It would have to be something that we all have equal. We're trying to figure out why we have an equal right to life. And so you can't have something that you can have more or less of. It can't be like a dimmer switch. It's got to be like a light switch, an all or nothing kind of a thing. Or you want to explain equality. Like if someone's like, oh yeah, yeah, we're all, like humans are all equal because we're all intelligent. <laughs> That's not going to do the job <laughs> of explaining equal rights. Why? because we're not all equally intelligent. And if you don't believe that, then today, uh, when you get home, go to youtube.com and click on the first video that pops up and just read the comments. <laughs> and you will find out that some people think better than others. And that's okay, they still have an equal right to life. I'm pro equal rights for obnoxious internet trolls. I'm just saying, they don't all think the same, so that can't be the thing that's grounding our equal rights. There's gotta be some other thing that we all have in common. So what is that thing? That's, that, like, and so the, the way that this actually sounds when I talk to a pro-choice person is different, though. Um, the way I, I usually say it sounds like this. Like, uh, uh, one of our last outreaches was, was at UC Davis. Um, one of the most hostile, easily the most hostile campus outreach I've ever been a part of in my life. We did something really controversial that day. We put some words on signs. That was it. We had a sign that says, should abortion remain legal? And we got a yes option and a no option and an it depends option. Two pro-choice options and a pro-life option and people flipped out. It was almost a riot. But anyway, before it got crazy, I was uh, like literally sitting on our pool table because this is where I like to end up. When I'm, when I'm doing an hours, I don't, have you ever seen like tall guys lord their height over short women? I don't like that. So like I like to kind of like get down like this because this is like, a, I, I want to try to meet people's eye lines. This is like basic like body language stuff. Like I just don't, I, I want I like there to be kind of some, some kind of an, an, an equality thing. And this is about as low as I can get without being weird, like getting on my knees or something like that. So this is kind of, this, this is where I am usually at an hour. So I'm talking to these three very, very pretty girls. And uh, see them. Uh, and eventually, to her credit, one of them, this is exactly what I was doing. My feet were dangling. This is, this is the perfect out. I like this person. I'm doing this. I know. I know. this. Why, what's your argument? Why are you here? And I was like, I'm impressed. Like, sometimes they don't care. They just like yell. So I, like, I explained in about two minutes. 
Yes, he said, go. What can you do with that two minutes? This is what I did. I said, I'm an open-minded person about almost everything. The only two things that I'm 100% confident in is that I said that 2 plus 2 is 4 in a base 10 system. Everything else is on a spectrum of confidence for me. Some things I'm pretty confident in, some things I'm very not confident in, some things are in the middle. It basically means that my life is a very uncomfortable thing. Because life's more comfortable when you're super confident, 100% confident in all of your views, the way I feel like almost everyone on my Facebook news is. <laughs> So I said, I'm really open-minded, but one of the things that would be the hardest for you to change my mind on is this. It's my view that everyone that I can see right now has an equal right to live. So we're outside of the supply. This is where like, everyone has lunch. So easily you can see 200 people. And I said, I think they all have an equal right to live. But that's kind of weird, isn't it? Because we're all so different. Look around. I told her, I said, like, I see tall people, I see short people, I see some people who are really smart, and I see some people who are, you know, <laughs> trying their best. And, and you've got people who are, you know, good at sports and music, and those that are not. You've got people, I said, there's at least three people I've seen roll by here in wheelchairs today. We have all these differences, and yet I think we all have an equal right to life. How can we explain that? Like, we all agree. Everyone in Western civilization agrees. But how can we explain that when there are so many differences? Now, this is usually where I would stop and ask them what they think, and they'll usually give me their definition of person, and we go from there. But in this case, I only had two minutes, so I just skipped ahead to my answer so that then they could respond. Um, I said, I think it's something like being human. Humanness. That's an all or nothing kind of, you can't be like part of that. You've got to, you're either human or you're not. And so if, if that, I mean, a little simplistic for the sake of the per person I'm talking to. We get really pulled off the We've tried that. Throws off the course with 99% of people. So like a philosophy graph. Professor. This we just this is be a little uh, Is I think something like being human. Um, and if that's the case, if the unborn have that, which they totally do, then they should have an equal right to life too. Or they do have an equal right to life. We're just not recognizing it. And the last thing I told them before I stopped talking was I said I notice I'm not pro-life for religious reasons, and I'm not pro-life for emotional reasons either. Like, I don't get the warm fuzzies when I look at a picture of an embryo. Like, that might be uncomfortable for you. I'm just, I'm just, honestly, like, like uh, the last week, my friends on Facebook, they had their first baby, and they posted that baby picture, like, right from the hospital. I had the little, you know, the, you know, it was, like, waddled, swaddled up. Uh, and I went, like, I did what everybody does. Like, oh, the baby, you know. And here's a cute baby. That doesn't always happen. It's, always, it's, not, it's like that, not double nice. What? Not all babies are. Like, two out of three of my kids were not pretty when they were first. Like, come on. <laughs> they grew into their kids. They were like amazing now, but like babies weren't all whatever. But they haven't grown to like school. Um, they're human. Uh, but so the, I had that moment that oh maybe. And but I don't have that when I see a picture of a zygote. Looks like a fuzzy orange. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not pro-life for religious reasons. I'm not pro-life for emotional reasons. I'm pro-life because it is the most rational conclusion that I can come to. Because I'm starting with equality as premise one. I am very, very confident in the importance of having an equal right to life. And I'm just trying to learn more about that and apply that knowledge to this less clear case. Um, I haven't heard a good argument for a good like definition of why people are valuable that shouldn't also include the unborn. There's plenty of other definitions of personhood, but they all make one of two big mistakes. And this is the direction we go. We're basically like, what is the answer that has the fewest problems? And I hear approaches people say you need to be sentient. You need to be like minimally aware of the world around you. I hear people talk about being self-aware. This is kind of like uh, you know more uh, advanced. Um, you need to be able to survive outside of a uterus. You need to be able to feel pain. You need to be able to be born. You need to be like, there's all these different things that people say, like, here's what matters. But all of those definitions take at least one of two really big problems that we point out. They either, like, imagine there's an equal right to life circle. Everything inside the circle uh, gets an equal right to life, and everything outside of it doesn't. Well, the problem is they either include too many things into the circle, like squirrels, 
or they exclude too many things like the awards. Um, and we will push really hard against those views. Um, so, like, when someone tells me, like, what they think makes a person, in my head, I'm running their definition through kind of this rubric. I'm thinking to myself, would their explanation of equal rights entail equal rights for adults? Like, that's basic. If it doesn't do that, it's not a good, it's like obviously not a good view. Um, but assuming it does, then I'm thinking, okay, would their explanation entail equal rights for infants? Does it do that? Um, because I think it should. As, the, as like the, a father who's been there for the birth of my three sons, I am a highly convinced that newborns should be in the circle. I don't even really think I need to have to make an argument for that. Like I can, but I'm not really concerned. Um, and then the third thing I'm thinking is, would their explanation entail equal rights for animals? Which I don't think it should. So here's how it sounds. So I don't like tell that to all. But this is like what it says. I think you're a person when you're minimally aware of the world around you. I'm like, okay, let's think about that. And I, tell, and, and I tell them a thought experiment that my brother came up with. We call it the zoo shooting. Imagine we go to the zoo and we're hanging out in front of the elephant exhibit and a gunman shows up and gets six bullets fired before he's tackled by security. So let's think about what happens. The first bullet goes into the bushes and kills the world's unluckiest cockroach. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what he did. I'm, I've got a pretty dark sense of humor, so you're all with me. Okay. <laughs> just say I, I, anything like being that unlucky and just bursty, like I don't know where. I think that's. I think it's gonna work. Second bullet kills a squirrel. Third bullet kills an elephant. It's a big bullet. Yeah. Yeah. You're just gonna have to kind of suspend disbelief just a little bit here. Fourth bullet kills a human newborn. The fifth bullet kills a toddler, and the sixth bullet kills an adult woman. Now, here's the question. How many of these things should be considered murder? In other words, how many things with an equal right to life have been killed? Not what is the law right now. I don't care. What should the law be? Well, how many of those things should be in the equal right to life circle? Cockroach, squirrel, elephant, newborn, toddler, adult woman. Now, if they said what you need to have equal rights is being minimally aware of the world around you, you tell me how many things are in the equal right to life circle now. What you say? Say it louder. Say it with gusto. Six. You got it. Six. All six. And I don't think that's the world I live in. This is where this is where we. This is not the only way you can put this in view. We can talk about temporary cases. We can talk about all, all kinds of things. But here's where we're gonna push back. Is I don't think I live in a world where a squirrel being killed is equally wrong as a toddler being killed. And, I'm, and, and, and hear me, I, I'm not like this, like, I hate animals, I reason to be able to abuse animals. Guys. Like, I'm not. I can find common ground with animal rights people almost every time. I have some serious concerns about the way we treat chickens and cows in factory farms. I don't have to think that humans and animals are equal to be concerned about that. If an animal can feel pain, that's morally relevant to the way that we ought to treat them. Um, the more, you know, self-aware they are. Almost everyone I talk to agrees with me on this. Like, this is not usually a big battle we have to have. Everyone in will talk to people. Like, I was, I was on a, a train several years ago. I was going from L.A. to Bakersfield. I just did a, a campus outreach. So I was on this train. I love trains because you get, like, a, like a, I had, like, a restaurant booth kind of a thing. Like, it was, like, a, you know, nice bench and a table. I had my laptop on. I'm working. And this guy's just across from me with a textbook this thick. And I was, like, you know, boom. And I was, like, what's the book? And he's, like, in school. And he wants to be on the first team to build an artistic robot. He has a book on, like, the one book that's been written on this. Book. And I was, like, ooh, that's interesting. You know, so we started talking about robotics and what is art and... Mm. Have you seen a robot? Are you going to prevent the end of the world? You know, I got kind of... And so, uh, so we had a whole conversation about that. I seriously, just re like just a month ago or something like that, I was, I was meeting with some uh, college, some pro-life college students. And one guy's like, I'm getting into robotics. I'm like, what, you know, have you seen a robot? He's like, you know, I keep meaning to see it. I'm like, dude, you need to like, don't like end the world because you haven't seen this movie. Like, you need to understand that. Anyway, it's funny in my head. Whatever, it's funny. You know what? I think I'm so uh, anyway, so we talk about robotics, and then he asked me what I do, and I said I try to help collectors be not weird. And so I started telling him about this outreach experience I had at Pasadena City College, and I said one of the things I just I said is 
said, I talk to all kinds of very different people. I talk to people of all faiths and a lot of people who don't have any faith, and yet almost everyone I talk to agrees that there's something special about humans. They might not all know why, but they all think that's true. And he's like, nope, my girlfriend would disagree with you. And I said, I don't really think so. He's like, no, I'll prove it to you. See, really, like, I, we've talked about this. And I tell you, this is if she lives it consistently, if she ever accidentally kills a bug, she has a moment of silence. Every step is a moment of silence. I said, I don't think she thinks humans and animals are the same. And I'll prove it to you. I said, if she ever accidentally ran over a kid, she wouldn't just have a moment of silence. <laughs> are you tracking with me? Like, it would at least wreck her day. It would, like, it probably be the most traumatic thing that ever happened to her, but it's not like she's going to get out of her car and be like, namaste, and move on. It's going to be a moment. It's going to be an event in her life. So, so it, I, and I know it's like a total California stereotype, but I'm not exaggerating when I said he, his response was, dude. I think you're right. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go talk to her about that tonight. I'm sure that so anyway, like the point, like like we push, like uh, I can find common ground with most animal rights people. It's just the ones who say like animals are equal or animals are even more valuable that we will push back against. Sometimes we'll tell them about my brother's old roommate. Those of you who are at the Leaders of Summit or heard, heard me hear me tell, tell, tell the story, because my brother's old roommate was is a hunter. So my brother told me a story about one time. It's like a weird experience because we're city boys, and so he had this weird experience one time where his roommate had gone out, he stalked a deer. And he shot it, and he brought it home. He skinned it, he made sausage out of it, and they ate it for breakfast. And Tim was like, this is weird for me. Like, he's like, this is awesome. I'm so, like, this is weird because, like, I've never been this few steps removed from, like, you know, the, the, the death of the deer. Like, how, is this different than McDonald's? Like, that kind of thing. He's like, I'm this whole existential experience. Uh, and, but, uh, he's, but they ate it. And I'll tell this story to an animal rights person. And they'll be like, oh my gosh! You know, I'm like, I know, right? You know? <laughs> what do you think should happen to his roommates? Like, he should be in jail! Right? You know? It's like, how long do you think he should be in jail for? Because like, you said humans and animals are the same. How long do you think he should be in jail for? He's like, oh, six months. Six months? I believe that he was gone. What if he did that to a girl? Are you I mean, pro-life and of experiments get a little grim. I'm sorry, but I just want to make sure you're understanding my argument here. What if his roommate stalked a girl, shot her, brought her home, skinned her, made sausage out of her, and ate her for breakfast? He should be in a Hannibal Lecter mask in a plastic cage talking to Jodie Foster for the rest of his life. Like, that's what should happen. It's really obvious. What six months? Because what happens is people get on beautiful green college lawns and the proverbial ivory tower and it's like really easy to say to be like I'm for equality everything is exactly the same it's hard to live that way I don't think most people I talk to actually think that so we'll, we'll push back um, where was I oh yeah okay so it, I, the, the, the whole like, you've just got to be minimally aware of the world around you is not a good definition of a person because if you put that in then basically just about every animal goes in the eco right to life circle and almost everyone understands intuitively that is not the world we live in. That's not a good view of the world. So what would make more sense? Sometimes what they'll do is they'll they'll change targets. They'll see the problem. They have a squirrel problem now. And then they'll move to something more advanced, try to fix it. We don't want squirrels in the circle. So they'll say something like self-awareness. And I'll say, what do you mean by self-awareness? I've heard like 20 different definitions. I don't want to like respond to what's in my head. What's in your head? I don't care what's, what's in your head. Like, you need to be able to know that you are a unique entity that will exist over a period of time. All right. Zoo shooting. Cockroach. Squirrel. Elephant. Newborn. Toddler. Adult woman. How many are in the circle right now? What do you think? One. It's more than that. Three. Five. Two. Which two? Child and the woman. Who said three? What three? Child, the toddler, and the adult. The child, the toddler. Oh, sorry, the newborn baby. The newborn, the toddler. See, so newborns are not self aware, though. <laughs> She's good! <laughs> Whoever this girl is, she gets to 
<laughs> you'll be paying attention to Caribbean like maybe the next leader of the club. I'm the same. And she's the, also the most introverted, and she's really uncomfortable than a point in her out. I'm just saying, she always gets the right answer. Yeah, it's the adult woman, the toddler, and the elephant. Elephants are one of about nine animals that we know are self-aware. Are able to understand cognitively that they are a unique entity. Whales, dolphins, some apes, even magpies can do some really cool things. I'm not saying they're equal to humans. I'm just saying they can do that thing. Newborns can't. Newborns probably can't do for the way I had to find it until probably five, six months after birth. So this definition has two problems. They have included too many things into the equal right to life circle, like elephants and magpies, and they've excluded newborns, or even like young babies, you know, up until like five or six months. I don't think that's the role I live in, and we'll push back against both those things, which order depends on what I have for lunch that day. But I'm going to push. Like, I really don't think I live in a world where it's like it's not that big a deal to kill babies. Uh, but like, if you shoot a magpie, it's like you know you should be in the jail for the rest of your life. Like, I just don't think that makes sense of the world. I want a definition that makes more sense than that. Well, I think something like being human makes more sense. It explains a lot of data about the world. It explains why racism is wrong. Racism is wrong because it focuses on a surface difference that doesn't morally matter. It ignores the thing that we all have in common, the thing that does matter. We're, we're human. We're all, we're, we, we are equal. We have the thing that actually morally matters. Anyway, so that's basically how this argument goes. And because we're starting with equality as premise one, and because of the way the zoo shooting works, like this squirrel thing really changes people's minds. Um, I see people change their mind a lot. Um, and it's just a matter of learning how to use arguments like this that actually connect with the other person. There are other ways of doing pro-life apologetics. Um, but this is what we are finding to work the best right now. It's the most persuasive argument I've ever used. Um, and every time we find something persuasive, we want to let our students know about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open it up for questions in about three minutes. While you're thinking of questions, I'm going to tell you about these two websites that, thankfully, oh, there's no way. Okay, <laughs> your teacher put on a smart board because I've got terrible handwriting. Um, Paul Thompson, if you're in the building, could you please call the main office? Paul Thompson, if you're in the building, could you please call the main office? Thank you. Blog.EcoRacistU.com has a whole bunch of articles that we've written with like, especially like practical dialogue tips, nitty gritty things that we found to work really well. Uh, and you know, after going through the fire, have about 3,000 conversations with virtuous people, things like body language, what kinds of questions to ask, what kinds of questions not to ask. Everything in there is free. It's awesome. My brother writes a lot of this stuff and he's a, because he's a better writer than me. Uh, and it's really, really helpful stuff. I like nitty gritty practical stuff. That's kind of what I'm always kind of oriented to doing. It's like I don't want you to just be here and talk about theories. I want it to be really, really helpful. I want it to add value to you. So if you want to have a good conversation with virtuous people, some really good stuff there. EquippedCourse.com is something that we just put out, made for clubs like yours. Um, because we had a problem. The way that we've always trained clubs is like this, like geographically going to the place and talking to people. Um, and the problem is, we have best friends in the pro-life movement. They're called Students for Life of America. And they've got a thousand clubs now. And there's not a thousand of us. There's like no way for us to get to all the clubs. So we need to come up with a solution to that. EquipCourse.com is our solution. We've taken the best stuff that we've learned and put it in 29 HD video lessons and then a podcast that we put out every other week. I actually just put out the new episode this morning. You should check it out. Um, it's on election thoughts. So, yeah, everyone's been wanting to know what we think about the. Uh, I'm not done, you know, wait, but we used to get a podcast. We talk about how to deal with the people who say that maybe uh, infanticide is okay. Like the people who bite every bullet, the people who are like, no, there's nothing that's objectively wrong. We've got three podcasts on dealing with that. It's just like the way that we kind of answer our students' questions and things like that. It's made to help equip you. I've told, uh, in fact, I, I don't remember, it might have been Anthony, um, but I was telling some high school student the other day, like, I think the most important thing your club can be doing, there's a lot of cool things your club can do, but easily number one, in my view, is getting set up to do really effective college campus outreach. There is just a kind of outreach I think you can do at a college campus that doesn't usually transfer as well to a high school. I'm open to being proven wrong about that. 
uh, but that's my view. And so there's this old saying that goes, uh, the more you sweat in boot camp, the less you bleed in battle. So this is time. Get really good now, because I'm having to train like sophomores and juniors how to get good at this so they can have some good conversations before they graduate college. If you walked onto your college campus already fantastic at pro-life dialogue, do you know how effective you're going to be in a college club? Not only talking to people, but leading a club of a bunch of others who are not yet trained to be effective? I think that's what you ought to be doing. You should get my course. So, this is over. I will take questions until 3, 40, and then I am done. Any questions that you have on your mind about anything pro-life related? We'll email the links out, by the way, so you don't have to worry about writing down. Yes, in the front. The argument. Um, usually, the way that I did the girls' name is just kind of I'll sometimes summarize kind of what I said. Um, I am uh, trying to figure out why you like the best. And you know, uh, it seems like of all the different answers I've heard, there's one that has the fewest problems. Is that it's something like being human, and that's something that the unborn has. The unborn is very, very clearly human. They have that thing that is essential. So it's not about whether, like, whether or not our intuition is that they should have a right to life. If, if we're being rational and open-minded to like following the evidence where it leads and not just presupposing what our answer is going to be before we get going, which is the wrong way to do it, then I think the most rational view is, is that the unborn ought to have equal rights. If you're pro-equal rights, you ought to be pro-life. That's how I wrap up here. Back here and then over here. like definitions of personhood. Um, the most one, often ones I hear are something like sentience. I hear self-awareness a lot. I hear um, viability gets thrown around sometimes. That one's pr a pretty weird one because it's a moving target as technology changes. Like it's a weird thing now where you could have a, a woman whose child is like 23 weeks old and is viable here in the U.S. but she could take a transatlantic flight somewhere else where it's like her child is not viable and thus a longer person as a review person. That's a strict. So I don't your viability is often anymore. Um, I've heard some really strange ones. I heard one person try to say that we should be using NASA's definition of life. And at the time, I didn't know NASA had a definition of life, so this was all news to me. It was like, what's NASA's definition? And I looked it up. It's true. Like they have, like they had to come up with something. Like what if on Mars we find life? Like that kind of thing. Like we have to have some working definition, but it's not a good one. Mm -hmm. Like it's got to be disconnected from anything else. It can't be a connected thing. And it's like, what fetus is connected with the umbilical cord? NASA's definition of life, that's not a life. Your life support's not life. You're not alive. You're getting ahead of me. <laughs> so I was doing it the first time. And it's just like, I think there's a few problems with this. Like in the beginning, the first week of life, it's not connected to anything. Like before implantation, like I'm not going to do all sex ed lesson, but like you probably know, like there's a... It's like a week, like your first water slide ride, basically. You go down the fallopian tube, into the uterus, and then you implant, and, and it's awesome. Uh, for that week, is it alive? And he's like, yes. It's not connected. And I said, but then it's not alive anymore. It's like, yep. And then it's alive again after birth. Yep. I said, so I just, it's it 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 true. We were just about to have our first baby, or I think we just had our first baby. So I'd gone to three days of awful birthing classes. And one of the things that I learned at those birthing classes is that there's this kind of new thing where people are like, um, who are more into like natural stuff, will actually not cut the umbilical cord until about a year, I'm sorry, a year, <laughs> not a year, um, an hour after birth. Because the idea is there's like nutrients in this, wouldn't that be crazy? You think pro-lifers are weird. Um, so tired. So anyway, the idea is there's nutrients in the cord, you keep it connected, and then after an hour it drains, and then it's useless, and then you cut the cord. So I said, so what if a parent did that? It's still connected after it's born. Is it alive? He's like, no. It's like, but it's crying and poopy. He's like, yeah. I said, isn't it weird to say that a crying and poopy thing's not alive? He's like, yeah, it's weird. So I tried one other thing. It's more like where you were where your head went. It's like, this is weird for this to be the NASA definition of life, because don't there astronauts when they do spacewalks, aren't they connected with a, like a tube like getting oxygen from the space? It's like, yeah. And I said, but they're offering life support. Like, isn't that 
It's like, yeah, it's weird. It's like, man, this is the point where you should abandon your view. Like, this is, there's some point where there's enough evidence, like, you just have the wrong view. It's like, oh, walk away. Well, you never know what you're going to hear, but you can usually work with it. Um, someone back here. Yes. Um, so you said that, like, the one common thing is that we're all human. So what is being human? Like, what's the so, so what I mean there, and once again, this is like the slightly simplistic definition because it's way more helpful to almost everyone I talk to. But what I mean is biologically human. It's like, it, it, like, like, the, like the, 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 it's not like some other definition of person or something. It's not a circular argument. It's, it's we're all members of the human species. We're all, we're all Homo sapiens sapiens is basically what that means. It's a little bit simplistic, but it's way more helpful than getting really, really, really nuanced because then just our conversations end up going nowhere unless we're talking to like philosophy professors or something like that. So we'll end up at some point on the course teaching the more really, really complicated definition. So I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, we're actually still working on it um, because there's a lot of different ways that pro-life philosophers have tried to explain it. Um, and we're kind of still doing some testing. It's just a little bit early for us to get into it. But I know it's not literally biologically human. But then we've tried stuff, and once again, like, you wouldn't believe how unhelpful this is in most particular places. It's, just, it's not that necessary for you right now, unless you end up talking to lots of people, and then you're going to want to get our course, because it's going to be really helpful. Uh, someone else have a question? Your course combined <laughs> it's not too religious of a course. So like there's like a sense where like, I mean, so so on our staff, we have a lot of religious diversity on our staff. Um, I'm in kind of a weird evangelical Arminian. We've got a woman who speaks in tongues. We have a Catholic person. We have um, a guy who's about to become Eastern Orthodox. And we have a Calvinist who is so Calvinist, his wife literally has a tulip tattooed to her forearm. I don't know if all of you get what that means, but anyway, it's a Calvinist thing. So there's a lot of religious diversity on our staff, and we work with atheists a lot. Um, there's, there's a growing movement of, of you know, like secular pro-life people, and they really like us, um, partly because we respect them and partly because like we're not really starting with religious arguments. But given that I do believe in God, sometimes that kind of leaks out a little bit. Like, like we're, we've decided to be true to ourselves to a, set, uh, to, uh, to, to a certain extent, but there's not like a cross in our logo. If you read enough of our blog, you get to you, you, you get a sense of who we are. We're not like hiding it, um, but it's not the first thing you find out when you go to our website because so many people like kind of discriminate against yeah. Christians. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so we're oh totally. I was, I had this one thing. I was at uh, Georgia State University, and there's this huge outreach going on, and um, the uh, I knew she was the pro life director of the Atlanta Archdiocese, very important. And she walked a couple of girls to me because she said they had stem cell research questions. And I've done a lot of research on stem cell research. I've written like two talks and a bunch of articles. And so she said, can you tell them about stem cell research? Like, all right. So I'm talking to them. And meanwhile, there's this guy off to the side, white guy, sunglasses, trench coat, just like not engaged but listening. And I'm like, all right. So I'm talking to the girls. And I gave, I gave like a two or three minute kind of 101 on stem cell research, the different types and why I'm only against one of them, the one where we kill babies for the body parts, so I'm not going to do that. But everything else, like if we can cure people, that's awesome. Um, so I finished my little thing, and one of the girls is like, oh, thank you, that's, like, that's really helpful. And then she asked, um, by the way, are you a Christian? And I said, and I quote, I am, but notice I did not use any biblical arguments in my case against embryonic stem cell research. As soon as I said I am, dude in the trench coat goes, ah, and he storms off. Like, he felt so like baited and switched. He'd been listening to this idiot for like three whole minutes, who believes in this crazy book that was written two thousand years ago, like that kind of thing, like instant discrimination. I made a lot of sense, but instantly he didn't want to hear anything else I had to say. So you got to get to know me a little bit. Uh, usually, if like your pro choice, uh, we don't hide it. If, if people ask me, I just tell them where I'm coming from. But so this course itself, like I don't have a whole like. Here's all the biblical pro-life verses. I can give a biblical pro-life syllogism. And if you're talking to a Christian, that actually might be the most helpful. Like if they really divide the and inspire the word of God and they believe everything, then like we there's a biblical there's biblical arguments that can be made. It's just not that helpful when we get on the college campus we're talking to being an atheist who don't believe in the word. Like they're not coming from the same same place. So. Yeah. You should ask a question. 
I've got time for one more question, probably. Yeah. How would you like uh, How would you initiate any of these talks? Would you just like bring it up at any dinner? That's an awkward Thanksgiving. Yeah. No, we have a motto: DBW, don't be weird. And so, <laughs> no. Um, so that's a. Really, this is one of the most common questions I get. Is like, how, how do you start this up? Because on a college campus, I think it's fairly easy. Students for Life, like every semester, has a new cool display they're bringing onto campus, and you set that up, and it kind of just attracts conversation. People come to you. We set up a really basic poll table. We change the questions sometimes. We like messing around with different questions. At some point, we'll probably put some time and money into like a cool looking display, like what they do. But like, for right now, like it, it works for us. Um, but and that that's easy because you're on a college campus. You, you you get your space and you set up this thing, and people come to you. <laughs> like. It, it's, it, it causes a stir, or at least it ought to. Uh, it, it, hopefully it causes a stir and they're not just all apathetic and they don't care. But it, you, that, that's pretty easy. So what do you do when you're outside of that? Like I've got people taking a course that are adults and they're like, what about me? What do I do? Um, and that's difficult because you want to try to do that in a way that's not weird. And Thanksgiving dinner is the wrong move, yeah. <laughs> most likely. I mean, every like we have, like our real motto is every conversation is a series of difficult judgment calls. So you might you might make a, a, a judgment call, um, but I think usually like it, I have a vision for the pro life movement, which is one where we are actually friends with pro choice people. That it's not like we've got to wait for them to come to dinner. It's like, could you actually be friends with a pro choice person? So one of my closest friends is this person in Vienna, who emailed me several years ago and said, I am a pro-choice lesbian atheist in Canada. So you wouldn't think that we'd have a lot in common, given this is from Canada. But <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm funny sometimes. Uh, I don't and so we start so we start the scene. So I see email be like an essay of why she's pro-choice. I responded, I picked one of her things and gave her a couple thoughts, and we start an email exchange. 140 emails later, we were friends. That's when we started Skype call. And we Skype for two, three hours at a time. And with some, we would spend some of our time debating or some really like, you know, kind of, sort of good, like an interesting pro choice blog. Like, she was smart. Um, and, but sometimes we talk about our lives. She'd ask me about my wife and my kids. And I, and I talked to her about like, when she moved out of her parents' house or I was there to grieve with her when her grandma died. Her first close family death since becoming an atheist. Um, talked about gay marriage a lot, as you can imagine. Um, and we could have those conversations because we built up a lot of trust and mutual respect. And in that context, we could have real conversations, not like what you see in 200 comment Facebook threads. Um, eventually, uh, like just to kind of to skip ahead of the story, um, a year and a half of dialogue later, she becomes pro life. And I asked her what it, what, what, like, why, what, what did it for you, you know, kind of a thing. And she said it was two things. One, she said she got to a point where she realized that all of her arguments had been beat soundly, and she was too philosophical to just ignore that. A lot of people get intellectually lazy and they just like, ah, I just, I get like protected. I'm not going to think about that. She, she, she knew, but she was scared because her entire community outside of me were not only pro-choice, but gay rights activists. The end of Facebook newsfeed is a very colorful place. This is her culture. This is, she was worried what would happen if she said this is pro-life out loud. And after about a month of dealing with that um, conflict, she went to the Canadian National March for Life, she got a white shirt and got a black sharpie, and she wrote out basically the equal rights argument on it. And she went to the march, she came back and got in front of a full-length mirror, took a selfie, or took, took a picture in the mirror, put on her Facebook and at that moment became as she came out of the closet for the second time in her life. Um, and I asked her, so what was so she said, well one, it was that I knew my arguments would be and then the second thing that happened, what eventually got me over my fear was that I knew that even if all of my friends rejected me, I knew that there was one guy on the other end of the fence who would welcome me with loving arms. And that did, that's what she needed. Um, here's the point. Um, it would be easy to think that my argument is that we should be friends with pro-choice people because we'll be more effective. That is true, but that's not my argument. You mm -hmm. want your friends and the people that you like intellectually spar with on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. But what's more important is that it is just good
good to love people. It is good in and of itself to love people. There's this guy named Jason Lepajarvi uh, in London who defined love this way. He said, love says that it is good that you exist. It's good that you exist, and in as far as I can, as, as I can, I will contribute to your happiness, your existence, your flourishing. Love says that it's good that you exist. And insofar as I am able, I will contribute to your happiness, your existence, your flourishing. That's how I feel about Deanna. I like to make her laugh. I want her to flourish. My view of her flourishing is different than her view of her flourishing, but you know, that's an ongoing conversation. Um, that's my vision for the pro-life movement, is you need to get outside your bubble and become friends with people who think differently than you. And it's a less comfortable place. Your time on Facebook's going to be less comfortable because now you're not in confirmation bias land. If you're conservative, you should not just be listening to what people like Sean Hannity have to say. If you're a liberal, you should not be just listening to like Chris Matthews and MSNBC, or else you live in confirmation bias land. And it's a lot less likely that you have true beliefs. It's not being challenged by smart people on the other side. You should be listening to smart people on the other side. Don't listen to dumb people on the other side. Listen to smart people who disagree with you, and then figure out what you ought to think. Yes. Um, and if all pro-life people did that, it changes the movement. You create a movement where people are pro-life and they stay pro-life because they know that it's not just a movement that has fetus tunnel vision, but a movement that cares about people. A movement of people who thinks that human trafficking is also really, really wrong and awful. A movement that thinks that poverty is really, really wrong and awful. Again, all those things. Like we, we care about life in general. And there is this one issue that we're really concerned about because it's legal to kill babies right now. Because people are really confused about unborn babies. And so we want to try to help people to be less confused about them. So there's less people being killed. That's a movement that people can get excited about joining. But it might take years of conversations with someone before they actually make that big change. And that's okay. We've got time. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Abortion is not ending in a couple of years. Um, I, I think it could end in my lifetime, but it's not ending in a couple of years. So I'm working with students like you, mainly because I think the future leaders of the pro-life movement are in clubs like this. And I want to train all of them. I want all of the pro-life leaders in 10 or 20 years to have gone through my course and to talk about pro-choice people not like they're the enemy, but like...